Hey fun fans, our featured FRC deep dive team is 1619 Upper Creek Robotics, and they've hooked us up with a sweet 1619 t-shirt. To enter, be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which 1619 video is your favorite. You can enter in any video that has this intro, so make sure you comment below. We'd also like to thank our sponsor of this show, Stryker. Discover why so many FIRST alumni and mentors are putting Stryker first when it comes to their internships and careers. Visit striker.com forward slash first to view career openings tailored to those in first. That's S-T-R-Y-K-E-R dot com forward slash first. We're going to jump right into some of these questions, starting uh, with Necro Creature wants to know, uh, what do you think separates your team from the average team in regards to how you operate? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a tough question, right? And Yeah, uh, that's a very general, but maybe if there's something that stands question. out. And I can uh, match the answer. You know, it's kind of a general answer. I think our team <laughs> culture uh, kind of reflects a an emphasis on excellence, right? Everything we do, we try to do to the best of our abilities, no matter what it is. If it's, you know, uh, cleaning the shop up, we want to make sure that the shop, you know, stays exactly the same as it was when we came in that day. We want to, you know, make some of the best videos in FRC. Everything we do, we focus on being, you know, the best we possibly can be. Uh, you know, sometimes we slack off a little bit and, you know, that's fine as long as, you know, when it's time to get serious, we get serious. And uh, I think our team does a really good job of, you know, applying our resources to things that really are our high value add. And then we also are blessed to have a lot of the manpower, facility, you know, monetary resources we need to do a lot of projects. And I think all of those things come together under that team culture to really set us apart in a lot of different things. Nice. Uh, our next question comes from James from 58. Now we kind of covered his question, so I might I might alter it a little bit. He said, I love seeing your unique designs each every year, uh, but how does your strategic process work, both for matches and in the build season in general? So we kind of hit on that already. Uh, so maybe you can talk about, um, is there anything you guys do to make sure maybe you stay on that strategic path that you, you know, you laid out your kickoff, but then how do you guys make sure that the robot, you know, through, you know, week three, week four, week five, week six stays on that path and, and keeps up with the strategic goals that you have in mind. Is there anything you guys do to kind of sustain that? Yes. Yeah, so we have a schedule that we lay out before the um, build season starts and we do our best to stick to that. Um, one thing that I think really helps is we have a Slack channel that our director of engineering updates everyone on the team um, on every night with where the robot's at, um, any problems that we've encountered, you know, when it's going you know, to be ready for wiring and that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that makes a huge difference in our coordination during the build season. Yeah, and you know, on top of that, kind of to your question, you know, our strategic process starts at kickoff, but you know, it's going to continue to evolve through championships, right? Um, and I think, you know, we do a pretty good job of altering course as we learn new information you know say a task was easier or harder to complete than we originally thought um, you know we'll review that and kind of see where we want to attack next as we finish you know different different aspects of the robot throughout the season uh, we'll talk about it here in a little bit but climbing this year was something that actually took a, a little bit of a turn from where we started at the outset awesome uh so the next question is from Connor McBride, one of our uh, fun contributors and hosts. Uh, he asked, how will the no bag era affect your team? Are you keeping the same build schedule throughout competition, et cetera? And then also he tagged on at the end, uh, he said, also CAD, question mark, which I'm assuming he means like, will you guys be releasing any CAD of your robots maybe? So, Right. right. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk to the CAD thing first. We generally don't release our CAD for um, a couple different reasons, but um, the most thing is we, you know, just don't feel a real need to. There's nothing that you can learn that you couldn't learn by asking us. And uh, also a lot of times our CAD files aren't 100% complete. Um, they're complete to the point that we can fabricate all the parts and put everything together, but they don't have a lot of hardware in them. There's sometimes, you know, surgical tubing missing and stuff like that. And, and if it wasn't, you know, 100% complete, uh, CAD model. I don't think we'd release that to the community. We are releasing CAD, I think, at some point of our pit carts, which um, people have been asking for for, I don't know, what, four years now or something like that. So uh, that should be coming pretty soon if uh, if we get our act together and get things out. Uh, 
Um, but how the no bag error will affect the team, um, you know, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, we're not changing a whole lot because of no bag. We are actually for the first time going, well, first time in a few years, going down to a five day build schedule. We were doing seven days a week, so like 39 wow. meeting. Um, so we're actually cutting that back this year. That's not specifically because of no bank. It's just um, no, we felt it was time to do that. You know, meeting seven days a week, your meetings tend to get a little bit less efficient throughout the week. And uh, so by cutting back a couple of days, we think we'll get some people some more rest, give students more opportunities to do homework uh, and still manage to you know, kind of pump out the, the quality of robots we really want to. Sounds good. Uh, next question comes from Spicy. Uh, don't know what team. And it says, how do you organize a full field every year? Is that part of your build space or is it organized separately? So I think, you, you know, we've kind of seen it already, but maybe uh, you guys can elaborate a little bit on, on how you guys deal with that every year. Yeah, so we actually have a construction team that was a part of our leadership structure, like you saw before. And the construction team, it, their sole responsibility is to actually build half of the fields um, that we can use. Um, so you can see the driver station walls up there. Those are all built by our students. And you can also see the rocket on the far wall there too. Um, so from day one, we're building the field. So then by the time we have a robot, we can be prepared to actually practice. Um, the building has been really great for us and we have a full size practice field and we build about half of it. Um, and we we're able to invite other teams to use it as well. So um, we've really helped boost Colorado teams to that one too. Yeah, nice. how much of the field we build depends a little bit on the year. Um, you know, like this past year, it really made no sense for us to build a full field as we, I think, went across the midline exactly zero times during real competitions. Uh, but in 2017, for instance, we did build uh, essentially a full field because we were doing full field cycles. Um, right. You know, it just comes down to the game. You know, we don't want to spend a bunch of resources on things we're not going to need. And so our construction team does a great job of working with the strategy team, the software team, the controls team, all at around that kickoff time to decide what we think we'll actually need. And then if that changes throughout the year, if like it did this past year, uh, they'll go back and you know construct new higher fidelity elements if we need them. Sounds good. We're happy to talk about a new sponsor of fun uh, that I've been a fan of in Michigan for a while. We've been around them a bunch. So Tyler, why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can't wait to talk about a course of your part of the couple thousand people that are in our Discord now. You should know uh, that we are beyond excited uh, to bring uh, on onto fun as fun is starting to grow and to help us accomplish our mission of uh, producing content that is loud, live, and independent. Our friends at Striker have stepped up to the plate, and well, guess what? Striker wants first alumni and mentors who are ready for a career with a cutting edge medical technology company who have a passion to enable and save lives. Uh, get this, not only does Striker pay top dollar for careers, I'm still waiting for my call, by the way, uh, they also pay great on internships and co-ops, but Striker recognizes the power of first mentors and volunteers. It will actively support you in first. Now, I don't know about the, the few of you that are lucky, those who are have jobs right now, but really how many of you can say that your employer actively understands what you do in first? Because as much as I love where I work, uh, it, they don't truly right now. Trying to explain what we do and what fun is, uh, that's a hard thing to get. And Striker really does understand that. So give Striker a thought and check out uh, what they have in store. Go to stryker.com uh, to find out more about Striker uh, and see if there's a high paying first supporting career internship or co-op for you that's s-t-r-y-k-e-r.com uh and thanks to striker by the way uh for helping uh keep fun a lot of live and independent uh guys you guys have been awesome stepping up with uh, donations and bits uh, and we're looking at getting to the next level we want to create more and more content for you and can't wait to do so so thanks a lot to striker for stepping up and helping uh let us do things like you know go to more competitions uh actually take a salary for once things like that would be nice and appreciated so thank you striker go check them out s-t-r-y-k-e-r.com uh, the next question, I think this is a lot of something a lot of people have been wondering about. Uh, so Kenneth from 930 uh, wants to know, in terms of videography and video editing, is it a team of people or was it a single individual? And if it is a team, what training do you guys provide or what practices do you have that help you maintain a consistent level of output quality year that's, to year? That's a really great question. We get that question um, quite often. Um, in the past, we've had... Um, 
Jeremy make all the videos and he's like the only one responsible for it. And we've just said, go make a video. And Jeremy has done a fantastic job. He's made probably the last, what, 20, 30 videos. Um, and they've been amazing. For this year, we have more of a um, structured team under engagement that's going to make videos. Um, it's still kind of in the works, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy's done a great job. Uh, you know, he kind of took on that responsibility. I think when he joined the team, he was really into it um, and obviously has done a great job, you know, continuing to hone his craft over the past few years. Unfortunately, he graduated. So, yeah, like Chelsea said, we're going to have to start uh, training up some new guys. Hopefully, we'll still pump out some reveal videos and recaps and stuff like that. But uh, you never know. Cool. Uh, Ian from 4467 asks, asks, how do you do CAD file management? So, you know, maybe, I mean, it sounds like you guys said earlier you're using SolidWorks, but are you guys using GrabCAD or just a local server? Or how do you guys kind of manage that? Right. Um, yeah, this, you know, we run a local server at the facility there uh, that gets backed up to uh, Google Drive, I think, and GrabCAD every night. Um, you know, we've got 10 CAD stations in our CAD lab that are almost always full. So working off of a local server on SOLIDWORKS does get a little hairy sometimes with write access and things like that. Um, but, you know, we found a ways, we found ways to make it work. Um, and, you know, we're sticking with that for now. Sounds good. Uh, Liam from 5104 asks, what was the iterating process like for your suction climb and how did you decide to go with that climb over something else? And Corey from Strikeforce, uh, similar question asked, when did you decide to do big suck climb during the build season since you were one of the OGs of suction? All right, so we started prototyping some suction stuff pretty early on in the build season, but ended up going down a different path for our climber until pretty close to our first regional when we decided that that wasn't gonna work and so we ended up switching back to suction. Um, most of the iteration was on the foam and we ended up changing out the vacuum pump so we have a fa faster evacuation time, but due to fairly short time frame, there wasn't a lot of time for iteration. Um, as far as why we chose it, it pretty much came down to our best option that we could uh, drop into the robot as a fully separate mechanism. Yeah, and allowing that double climb was also yes. a, a huge differentiator, right? Uh, yeah, like, like JC said, we did have a different climber kind of in mind until that fell through. And then uh, some of the suction work we had done early on in the season uh, got pushed to the forefront, um, especially after teams uh, kind of unveiled that on Robot Reveal Night. I'm looking at you, 694. Uh, we were actually <laughs> hoping we could keep that in the bag for a while and then bring it out closer to champs so that uh, people wouldn't be able to copy it as much. But... It ended up not being too big of a deal and was our best climber going into our first event. Do you guys have any regrets? I know uh, when we had Strike Force on, they were saying they're not sure if they'll do suction all that much going forward. Do, what, how do you guys feel about it? I don't know. JC, what do you think? I was pretty happy with it. It was once it once we got it working, it was pretty consistent. Yeah, I think I think that hits the nail on the head, right? Yeah, uh, getting it, you know, getting the the right gasket material and the right geometry for the climb was probably the hardest part. Um, and then remembering to uh, plug in the hoses after we unplug them to pull it off the half. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The applicability of suction, I think, is uh, is very niche, right? You had teams like 971 this year that you know used it for game pieces, but a lot of a lot of the time suction isn't a great um, a great intake mechanism because of the game pieces are moving around and it requires you know, the suction cup or whatever to be placed fairly precisely on the, the game object. So um, I don't know that we'll ever use it again. Uh, if they ask us to climb a stair like they did this year, we might pull it out, but uh, it's really depending on the scenario. Fair enough. Uh, Dylan from 1259 asks, do you consider overall robot architecture along with mechanism design in your design process? And how does CAD fit into that in your design process as a whole? So yes, we do um, bring the overall robot architecture into our design process. Um, usually after we've developed a list of 
possible mechanisms. Um, and so we bring that in and then we start doing some 2D sketch work and SolidWorks and uh, BlobCAD, which uh, we use to just kind of figure out how different mechanisms would fit together and the feasibility of different combinations. Sounds good. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to skip this one. Uh, Andrew Schreiber asks, where are the best places to eat in Longmont and where are the best adult beverage locations? Um, yeah, I'll take this one because I think I'm the only one that can speak to the second <laughs> part of that question. Uh, you, know, you know, best places to eat in Longmont, you know, I think Georgia Boys Barbecue is probably at the top of the list. They're pretty decent. Uh, I also really love Fuzzy's Tacos, even though it's not necessarily a Longmont thing. Uh, I love Fuzzy's. It's my favorite place. And then as far as, you know, places to drink go, I think uh, Left Hand Brewing and Whippy Brewing have uh, both have great tasting rooms. Oscar Blues also has a pretty cool tasting room called the Tasty Weasel. Uh, so all those are good options. But if you want to know more or if anybody else is traveling into beautiful Longmont and wants to, uh, wants to get some insight, feel free to hit me up in a cheap Delphi DM. And I'll let you know what's up. Just slide on into Clint's DMs, everybody. There you go. Uh, please don't. But. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.